Attention American poker players, do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? Then head to GlobalPoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for U.S. players. That's GlobalPoker.com. Have you heard about America's Card Room? Already the most trusted U.S. online poker site since 2001, America's Card Room deals out more than 246,000 hands of real money poker every day. And right now, Poker Stories listeners can get in on a great deal. Just head over to americascardroom.eu and sign up using the promo code CPPODCAST. New players will get a 100% deposit bonus up to $1,000, 20 days of free jackpot poker, and four entries into the $250 new depositor free roll. Don't wait. You can be playing poker online right now. Head to americascardroom.eu today and don't forget to use the promo code CPPODCAST for your bonus. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 30, featuring a true legend of the game, Linda Johnson. Now, Linda has been playing poker for more than 40 years, and during that time, she has seen the game from pretty much every possible angle. Uh, as a player, she became the third woman to win an open bracelet when she took down a Raz event at the 1997 World Series of Poker. And even these days, you can often find her playing in some of the bigger Omaha 8 or better cash games during the summer. Uh, Linda has always been an advocate for player and dealer rights, which led to her involvement with the Tournament Directors Association, serving on the board. She also helped start the World Poker Tour, and worked as the studio announcer for the first six seasons. If that wasn't enough, she also owned and operated Card Player Magazine for eight years before selling the company to focus on Card Player Cruises, which she is still a partner in today. Linda was inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame in 2011, becoming the second woman to join the exclusive club, and just last year, she was also given the inaugural WPT Honors Award. This is a really fun podcast to record, and Linda has some great stories, including a funny story about a forgotten woman in poker history, which I think you guys will enjoy. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here's my conversation with Linda Johnson. I am here with... uh... The first lady of poker, Linda Johnson. How are you doing, Linda? Life is good. No complaints. Yeah. How, how are you liking the first lady of poker nickname these days? Actually, I've never liked that nickname. <laughs> Mike Sexton gave it to me, but it kind of reminded me sort of like the old lady of poker. So it's never never been one that I would have chosen. Right. It's not like you're married to the president of poker. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and if you take it the other way, you can't literally be the first woman in poker. I mean... Oh, I hope not. I'm not that old. You were the first to do a lot of things in poker. But I don't think you were the actual first lady of poker. No, no, no. I'll, I'll welcome suggestions for new nicknames. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Um, Long Island, New York? Yeah, my birthplace. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was military uh, baby. My dad Air Force was Brad. Air Force, yeah. yeah. What did he do? He, um, he was in charge of the recreation programs on different bases. So we moved every three years, and it was a good education getting to... Uh, be uprooted and leave all your friends at an early age, <laughs> but it, it taught you to be you know yeah. tough and to, to better make, make be new gregarious friends. too. Absolutely. Uh, wait, what is a rec? You can't just pass that uh, by me without getting some detail in there. So your dad basically like hosted like the uh, the sock ops. <laughs> I, I don't he, understand. He put he ran the gymnasium and all the leagues. Like um, they have uh, you know basketball leagues in mm-hmm. the Air Force and baseball, and he refereed and umpired and ran mm-hmm. all their all their uh, gymnastic programs. Uh, what about? Um... Uh, bringing in like the Bob Hopes of the world was that a thing? <laughs> Actually, no. But I, now that you mentioned Bob Hope, I did work at the USO for a while. That was kind of fun. That's where I met my husband. Actually. Okay. What well, so, can you tell me about about that part of your life? Um, he was in the Vietnam War, and I was a hostess at the USO, and I I met him, and um, we started dating, and then he had to go to Vietnam, and um, we got engaged before he left. We got married when he came back. And we were married for about 10 years. Um, great guy. Still love him. But 
uh, actually poker kind of broke us up, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I really fell in love with poker. Yeah. And that was the love of my life. At All right, I want to get to that crossroads of your life. But first, I got I to gotta ask you about working at, for the U.S. Postal Service. What, why and how did that, that come about? And are the stereotypes true? Uh, well, I'm not a, a crazy maniac, I'd like to think, like some of them. Uh, that's the stereotype. I guess they're the ones who go around shooting places up in the, in the stereotype of the postal worker. But yeah. um, I started out at the age of 18, and I started out working on a letter sorting machine, and I worked my way up through the ranks. I was actually first in line to be a postmaster in my district when I fell in love mm. with poker. And was this I, in New York? This was in uh, California. So, That's right, because you had moved all yeah, over the place had, uh, yeah. with your dad. Right. Um, and I, I was level 17 at the time. I was making like $50,000 a year back in 1980. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, listen, I need to follow my, uh, my dreams and become a poker player. So I left this fabulous job. I broke we, we my mother's to, heart. We need to say to that Vegas. again. 50000 a year in 1980. In 1980, yes. I and had let's to, not forget government benefits. Yes, yes. I mean, I was first up to People be People will take that now. Yeah. <laughs> Stamps would probably be $2 each by now, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was it was security. And uh, I, I felt like it was worth the gamble because I knew that I wanted to be a poker mm -hmm. player. And I felt like you know, if it didn't work out with poker, I could always go back and get a good job doing something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, I didn't want to be 80 and regret that I had never given myself the chance to be a professional poker player. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in 1980, when I entered the World Series of Poker and I came in fifth that year, I went back and gave my notice and uh, moved to Las Vegas two weeks later. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how you got into poker because you were a gambler before that playing blackjack, right? With these junket well, trips and stuff like that? Yes. When I turned 21, I really wanted to gamble. And so I started... Well, where did that to, come from? I'm not sure where that came from, actually, because up until that point, I wasn't like extremely adventurous or, um, you know, I, I didn't really have the gambling gene. But all of a sudden at 21, when I went to Las Vegas for the first time, played blackjack, loved it, mm -hmm. and started commuting and playing blackjack. And... Uh, my dad said, "Look, if you're going to gamble, you need to play poker because you know you're in poker. You you can win, and you're not playing against the house." And so he even knew that back then. Yes, my dad actually supplemented his income uh, in the military by playing poker. He mm -hmm. played. I never played. You know, yeah. most people who became professional players played their whole lives. I never played a hand of poker till I was 21. Yeah. So you never like saw him around the kitchen table and took interest. I never saw him. He didn't play at our house. No. Mm -hmm. Uh, my mom had three children to raise, and uh, so there was no gambling at our house. Now, my mom... the you, the, uh, the youngest, oldest? I, I'm the middle child. Okay. Yeah. But my mom hated gambling. I mean, she cannot stand... She's like... My mom is like Mother Teresa. She cannot stand to take <laughs> money from somebody else, and mm -hmm. she like, feels bad if she, if she um, beats oh, somebody out of something. You just inspired a great question I'm going to add to my uh, arsenal at the end here. Continue. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So my the extent of my mom's gambling would be when she would come to visit me, she would bring a bag full of nickels, you know, a little Ziploc bag with nickels to play the slot machines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then from there. <laughs> so I think I broke her heart, actually, when I moved up here. Um, but well, she was What supportive. about your siblings? Did they take on... Uh, gamb gambling related jobs as well, or no? I, I have a, a younger sister. She's she was a nine one one operator, and I had a older brother who was a businessman. Mm -hmm. Now, at the age of fifty, my older brother came to me and said he wanted to learn to play poker. Yeah, and I taught him, and he's been quite successful at it. So now he enjoys playing recreationally, yeah. but he he's uh, actually making a little bit of money at it. So talk to me about those early days, and um, you're obviously you have the job at the post office but or, or the postal service i should say um you know how successful were you what games were you playing and it, what made you think hey i could do this because at the time there wasn't a lot of people doing it and and there was zero women doing it you know so right um I started playing in Gardena, and all they had was California. draw poker. Gardena, California, because I lived and worked in Long Beach, California, and mm -hmm. that was like 20 miles away. So on my uh, days off, I would come to Las Vegas and play, but on my normal days, when I got off work, I would go to Gardena and play. And uh, I also played with some of the guys from work, and they they were happy to have me play at first until I started winning, and then it was like, no, we yeah. don't need you. Um, so, you so stop getting playing. invited back. <laughs> <laughs> so I played in Gardena. 
and it was it was all draw poker. Mm -hmm. And Gardena was a tough place. I mean, it was a smoky, dingy um, card rooms, and you had to deal your own. And man, the people there were nasty. I mean, like if you, we paid time, I believe. And if you didn't hurry up when it was your deal, I mean, they would just <laughs> yell at you. So it was a bunch of miserable old people sitting around playing. But I still loved it. I had yeah. a great time. And uh, then, as I said, I was going to Las Vegas on the weekends, and I started making a lot of money. I was playing, back then we played six card stud. Hold'em really hadn't come to Las Vegas uh, yeah. in 1980. It was just starting to get here, but it wasn't that popular. So stud was the game, six card stud actually. And I was playing very low limit. Well, how does that work? Uh, where does the car, the the extra card go away? It's it's two down, three up, and one down. Okay. So, yeah, and instead of four up. Um, but it was, a, it was a fun game and I was doing really well and um, loving it, you know. So then I, I finally said, okay, I'm moving here. And once I moved here, I loved it even more. And yeah. I would, because I was playing low limit, I had to play a lot of hours in order to make a living. But I can remember I would go out mid afternoon and I would play until the sun was coming up. And, you know, as I was driving home, I would like say, man, do I really get to do this for a living? I just, I've always loved it from the minute, yeah. from the first hand I played a poker um, till today. Like I, I don't consider myself to be um, a degenerate gambler by any means or even an addicted gambler, but I know that the next time I get to go and play poker, I will love playing poker. Yeah. If you still have the itch after all these years, I mean, that means you did the right thing. Yes, I definitely did the right thing. And uh, my mom came to realize that I did the right thing when she sees how happy I am and she started getting free cruises and cars and stuff <laughs> like that. So, so I think I turned her around too. Yeah, that'll usually do it. Um, what were those early games like? Who was the crowd? Who were you playing against in those days? Uh, what kind of games were there even around in Vegas at the time? Okay, so in the early 80s, um, Hold'em was just coming to town. I was playing with mostly men. It would be very unusual to see more than one other woman in the mm -hmm. card room. Uh, there were probably... Was that Barbara Enright? Or she only <laughs> Bar showed Barbara up at the was WSOP? Here, yeah. Um, um, Sissy was here. Um, Shelly. There were three or four women who made a living in the in the early 80s, and yeah. I was one of them. So. Uh, it was not like it is today. It was a very um, nasty uh, scenario, nasty atmosphere as far as uh, gruffness. Nasty and, towards women or just nasty to everything? <laughs> Towards women, but also towards each other and towards yeah. the dealer. There was a lot of abuse in the card rooms, a lot of verbal abuse, and uh, it, and, and plus the, everybody smoked. And I mean, people would yeah. just intentionally blow smoke at you. <laughs> I caught the tail end of that in South Florida as like an 18-year-old playing, you know, two-two limit hold'em, where they still had smoking at the tables, and I was just like, I can't. Yeah. An it, hour tops, and I'm out of here. I yeah. can't do it. I can't even imagine how you had to fight that. As it was your horrible. workplace environment for years. Right, right. Here's some trivia for yeah. you. Yeah. What was the first card room in the world to go non-smoking? I think I know this because I talked to Tom McAvoy. I'm still going to mess it up. Was it Orleans? No, it was Card Player Cruises. So we oh, were the that's very right. okay. first. And I can that's remember right. this one guy. He was so upset. And he's, you know, we said, sorry, you can't smoke. And he says... Well, no one's going to tell me I can't smoke. And so I went over to my business partner at the time, Denny Axel. I said, Denny, this guy's insisting he can smoke. And, and Denny had a little chat with him. And, um, and the guy says, next person to tell me I can't smoke, I'm going to take him outside. So Denny says, okay, you can't smoke. Let's go. <laughs> and the guy, he was bluffing, and uh, he put a cigarette out. Yeah. So. But uh, I think uh, Bellagio was one of the first in, in Las Vegas, if I yeah, remember. Yeah, I can't right. remember. The, uh, you can go back and listen to Tom McAvoy on the podcast, listeners, mm -hmm. and he'll tell you the actual story of the first tournament, I think, that he set up in town with a, a non-smoking tournament. Mm -hmm. A crazy concept at the time. Right. Kind of right. like a, the concept of no headphones on at the table these days. Exactly. So, um, yeah, but, but it's so much better today. You know, I always tell ladies today, you will enjoy being in a poker room. Um, I would not have wanted to bring my mom into a poker room in the 80s, and today yeah. I would be happy and proud to Well, do you have her. any horror stories from that time? Um, I witnessed you some bad call, things. You want to call people out? <laughs> <laughs> um, I witnessed some, some bad things, mostly um, abuse towards the dealer. Yeah. Um, people, you know, I stood up for myself, so if, when you stand up for yourself, people stop being bullies, I think. Yeah. So I didn't take uh, as much abuse probably as some women did. 
Um, People knew not to mess with Linda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I just let my chips talk. Yeah. Oh, I like that. He's letting his chips talk. Um, so at what point... Um, well, at what point did... I want to hear about Card Player. I started at Card Player in tw- 2006 as an intern. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I got that history covered. Uh, can you talk about you know what led you to buy Card Player at the time from the fields and uh, sure, sure. your experience mm-hmm. running it? The first ever Card Player cruise was in 1992 in December. Mm-hmm. I went on that cruise as a poker player who never wanted to be anything other than a poker player. And I had so much fun on that yeah. trip. Um, I went with my fiance, uh, Scott Rogers, and my uh, dear friend, Denny Axel. And the three of us were sitting around waiting for debarkation on a week later. Uh, and we said, you know, we had so much fun. Let's go and talk to the fields and see if uh, there's something we can do the to join The fields owned both? The fields owned both. At, at that point, it was one company. Card mm-hmm. Player Cruises was part of Card Player Magazine, owned mm-hmm. by Card Player Magazine. And so we went to the fields and we said, you know, do you need help with anything? We want to make sure we never miss another cruise. And to our astonishment, they said, well, you know, we're ready to retire. So (laughs) we'd be happy to sell the magazine, which would also uh, be the cruises. And so... um, And you like magazine. I just want to be on the water. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't know anything about running the magazine. And plus, we didn't have the money. So we went to a venture capitalist and we got the money and we bought the magazine with the agreement that the fields would stay on for six months and train us. And they did. And uh, we started out. We didn't know a font from, uh, you know, what from a from anything. We just didn't know. We were poker players. But uh, we actually, uh, you know, I believe the same, you know, bluff it till you make it and we did we bluffed our way through and uh the timing was perfect for us because they were just starting to expand poker when we first bought the magazine it was only legal in california washington and oregon and then all of a sudden the east coast it came into atlantic yeah. city and then foxwoods and all these big places and uh, all those there advertisers was, yeah there was nowhere <laughs> else to advertise and so we took a gamble the first year and it was it used to be a newspaper, right? It was a newsprint. That's what yeah, that's the gamble we took. The first year we made like twenty five hundred dollars. And these places were opening up and it was newsprint and you know, my business partners, Denny and Scott, they said, you know, these big big um corporations aren't going to want to advertise in a in a newsprint. We we have to go glossy and make it attractive. And I was like no way it's going to add 100000 to our print bill to go glossy. And I said, we only made 2500 <laughs> Well, we had this, this uh, arrangement between the three of us that whenever it came to a business decision, we would vote. And one adamant would outrule two, would outrule two well, I think I'd rather prefer this way. Yeah, yeah. So on this one, all three of us were adamant, and I lost the vote, and I wasn't happy. But they were right. I, yeah. I, I'm willing to admit when I was wrong. Once we went glossy, then all the, the big car dreams came in. So it was a good business decision. Way to go, Danny. Way to go, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved being the publisher of Card Player Magazine. Um, we, after a couple of years, we bought out our um, our cat. Uh, venture capitalists and the three of us owned the magazine and then as you know in uh, two right around 2000 we sold to the Shulmans who still own it today and yes. treat me great oh <laughs> get in a plug yeah <laughs> there you go uh yeah I'm, I'm, when, I'm, what about the cruising during that time and what made you want to like uh keep going on with that okay um the cruising was the part that i liked the best uh it's it's there's nothing better than a cruise it's the best vacation you can possibly take so when i was ready to sell the magazine i wanted to still be cruising so we um i only sold the magazine portion and we separated card player cruises a lot of people think that they're owned by the same company Mm -hmm. they're not they're two separate businesses and today um uh we have card player cruises as a separate entity yeah, you uh, you must have some numbers and all those miles you've you've sailed over the years. Numbers? Yeah, how many countries have you visited? Oh wow! What, what, I made see. a. I, started I don't see making a map a list. up in your house. With pins <laughs> I started in it. making a list the other day, and I got to like 112 okay. countries. And uh, <laughs> you know, I'm sure there's a couple I've forgotten, but it has been wonderful. I mean, uh, we I've been on more than 300 cruises, mm-hmm. and half of them were poker cruises. 
Um, and being out on the sea and, and able to unpack once and see all these different places uh, and, and play poker in a fun atmosphere. I mean, at Card Player Cruises, we don't allow any abuse, zero. Yeah. Because that's the one thing that's, that always bothered me in card rooms was when management put up with abuse. And so you'll hear more laughter on a, a Card Player Cruises trip than on any, uh, in any card room in the world. And it's mostly recreational players who are there to have a good time. Yeah. That's great. Let's talk about uh, your time with the WPT. Okay. And how did, how did that come to be? Because you, at the time, uh, were, were trying to be a player. Um, yes. Well, what happened with WPT is um, Mike Sexton and I had done uh, a documentary from the TOC with Steve Lipskin, and it had come off very well. And so uh, Mike and I were in Costa Rica, and Steve... Uh, Lipscomb, who founded WPT, flew down and wanted to talk to us. And we had this meeting out there in the middle of the rainforest. Mm -hmm. And he talked about this concept of having a, uh, an international tour where you could see the whole cards. And and um, we liked the idea of it. And the problem was uh, he needed uh, a few million dollars. <laughs> and so uh, he wanted to know if we knew anybody that had it. And um, we set up, actually Mike set up, a meeting with Lyle Berman, and uh, when we got back to the United States, the three of us, Mike, Steve, and, and I went to Lyle's apartment, and we pitched the idea for the World Poker Tour, and Lyle bought it. Um, we had, he gave us uh, uh, three months to come up with 10 uh, card rooms that would, would be members, and, and that would allow us to come and film, and we were able to get them in like two weeks so yeah. so that's how world poker tour started that's how mike got his job as uh the studio announcer that's how i got my job as a studio i'm sorry he was the the tv announcer and i was the studio announcer yeah and um i did it for six years i loved it got to travel all over the world got to meet lots of great player players um nice people and uh, it was it was a real family, the WPT crew. We, yeah. we loved Vince. He fit in perfectly. All the directors and producers were wonderful. Um, I think my favorite part was showing up and getting my hair and makeup done. That was great. <laughs> and, and, and getting to travel. My least favorite part probably was having to be at the end of the show where I had to stand next to the beautiful uh, hostess. You know, oh, the, the, so, the yeah. constantly yeah. rotating cast of hostesses yes, over the years. Yes, exactly. Which um, was your favorite? Can you rank them? Shana, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Shauna Hyde. I, <laughs> that's an easy one. Everyone's favorite was Shauna. That's an easy one, yeah. And, can't, uh, can't beat the original. Right. She, she was great. But, you know, they... Um, Sabrina Godecki was was great. I Sabina, mean, yeah. Sabina, yep. She was wonderful. They did were. She I married mean, David were, Lee. Did she? You know the NBA player David oh, Lee. No, I didn't Not know sure. that. I don't know. I didn't know what happened to her. But but, they were together, and then that's yeah. how David Lee got lessons from Phil Hellmuth mm -hmm. when he was playing with the Golden State Warriors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Irrelevant. Yeah. So <laughs> we had we had lots of good times traveling. I think. The scariest moment happened in Costa Rica. Okay. Um, back in the, in the early days of WPT, the um, the card rooms would instead of the Royal Flush com girls coming out, we didn't have Royal Flush girls. So the card rooms would would uh, figure out a way to present the money, and they would all try and do it unique. You know, like um, in Costa Rica, <laughs> they decided they were going to bring it out in an ox cart uh, because the ox cart is their national symbol, I guess, and and so. Uh, prior to this happening, I went outside <laughs> to see what was going on, and there were six 2,000-pound oxen, and they were just like, it looked like they wanted to stampede. I mean, they were, you know, they were snorting, they were uh, grounding their hoofs into the, you know. For some I mean, reason, I pictured people in costume, but you're saying so real animals. Real animals. We're going to come onto the set. Real security guards with shotguns. And <laughs> I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is like, this has potential to be the biggest disaster ever. Because if they get inside this very small enclosed arena yeah. and they decide to stampede, you know, what is going to happen here? And uh, I was so scared. And then when they came in, they were like little kittens. And what was happening outside was they just couldn't wait to perform and to trot around the arena there. Yeah, yeah. And so they came in and, and, it, and it worked out fine. But that was probably the scariest moment I, I ever had. I have to YouTube that one. I can't remember that yeah. one being the intro. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I think I was there for um, the last two years that you were the, uh, the studio announcer mm -hmm. following the, the tour. I remember, you know, long, long day, long nights yeah. recording. Uh, yeah. The castle in Spain. 
Did right. You go to the, in, what was that Paralada or? Um, actually, actually, um, Spain, we did France, uh, the aviation club. Spain the was probably club. in the seventh or eighth year. I was only there the first six years. Yeah. But um, I think my most embarrassing moment was actually when I was playing on WPT, and it was a ladies' night, and we were down to heads up, and I was really enjoying playing, and it got down to Christy Gazes and me, and. Um, in the heads up interview, all of a sudden, right in the middle of it, I get a hot flash. Now, <laughs> you men don't have to relate to this, but, but there is nothing you can do when you get a hot flash. You are just going to break into a sweat. And so I remember the hostess interviewing me and says, Linda, it looks like you've broken into a sweat all of a sudden. Are you nervous? And I said, <laughs> No, you'll get old someday too. You know? and, so the, and so thank God the heads up only lasted about eight hands. But if you ever go back and look, you'll see at the end that there's a towel on my lap. They did a good job of trying to edit around it, but it was a nightmare for me. <laughs> you know, you can't always trust those live reads you got. Um, let's talk about uh, the Poker Hall of Fame, 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, second... Uh, woman to get in. Uh, there's three now: Barbara, you, and Jennifer Harmon. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who's next? You just want me to cry, don't you? Because I, I just going want back next. to these memories that are so beautiful. Who is next? Wow. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, let me bring up an example. Okay. So Vanessa Selps, right? Uh huh. Number one in tournament winnings uh-huh. by a large margin. Mm-hmm. Huge lead over Kathy Liebert in second. Yep. Um, but she just retired. Yes, she, she left. So technically, she's not going to stand the test of time, you know, unless she happens to get hot and win a few bracelets. Yeah, I would know. have definitely said her name um, as as probably the next one um, be, before she retired. As a lock, but you have to be yeah. yeah, as a lock. You have to be forty as well. So exactly. Yeah, she wouldn't qualify for. That's quite what I'm a saying. There's while. so many years before yeah. that happens. Yeah. So like, I think Maria Ho. Maria, Maria Ho. Ho will be next, in my yeah. opinion. She's amazing. She's a great person and a great player. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, what does it feel like for you to be in the Hall of Fame? It's an honor. Um, see. <laughs> I know we did this to you in 2011, too. You know, I, was, I actually reread your speech this morning. Did you? Yeah. So, so I made it through. The, the over-under on me crying was 30 seconds, and I got through <laughs> it. Um, but, uh, yeah, when, I, you know, when you think back on these things that are such honors, it's, it is moving. And uh, I, was, I was thrilled. Yeah. Beyond belief to, I never thought, uh, you know, I would get into the into the Hall of Fame, and um, it's it's all I can say is it's an amazing honor. And yeah. I'm very grateful to the voters. So, well, what do you what do you what are your thoughts on like uh, as far as the legacy? You know, I mean, you obviously are not done yet. You know, you still got plenty <laughs> of cruising to do as well. But, right. um, you know, what what do you what do you want people to remember about? I think, Linda, the, I think the, the legacy player. and probably one of the major reasons I got into the Poker Hall of Fame um, mm-hmm. is because I took a stand against abuse. And um, back in, after I had had the card player for a few years, um, it was still very tough atmosphere in the card rooms. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went to um, Jack McClellan and, um, and, and his partners who ran the World Series, and I said, look, we have to do something about this, otherwise card player is gonna start writing about it. And you know, the abuse in the poker world is kind of a poker's dirty little secret. And I said, and I'm not gonna overlook it anymore. It has Dealer to change. abuse, player abuse. Dealer abuse, player abuse, yes. Yeah. And that year, they took it to heart and they, they started the uh, penalty system. Yeah. And um, then a couple years later, we started the TDA to regulate poker. So I think those two things would, would be my legacy. Um, you know, it's not going to be that I was an outstanding player. I've been a winning player for years. Um, but, you know, um, to get into the Hall of Fame, you know, one of the requirements is, is that you have to play at the highest levels. And I don't do that by any means. Um, so I think it's because of the uh, helping to stop. Well, I also don't want to sell yourself. You play some pretty <laughs> high stakes, you know, Omaha every summer. I see oh, you I at like the World that. Series. Yeah. yeah, I like that 75-150 game. That's but... pretty high stakes for most people. <laughs> I'm not going to get in that game anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I do enjoy that game. Um, but I, I think, you know, starting the TDA was key because yes. that, uh, you know, p- people who traveled at the circuit, now they had a, a base list of rules and, mm-hmm. and they would know automatically that if you were TDA that they used a, a 
dead button versus a moving button. You would know how many raises there were in limit poker. You would, you know, you would know, you know, what you could and couldn't mm-hmm. do, and you would know what the penalties would be for 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 doing bad things. So I Man, think that moving button always gets me every time I'm in a LA cash game. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, why am I the small blind and the but what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So California does it different. Um, I don't know that cash games will ever be standardized, but being able to standardize the basic rules in yeah. uh, in uh, tournament poker was it's a massive. Big, it's big huge. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Matt Savage certainly was inter- instrumental, and Jan Fisher and Dave Lamb, the four of us, founded the TDA. And uh, you know, I was. On the board for the next um, 15 years, uh, Jan and I just, and Dave, you know, just resigned from the board. We feel like it's a younger person's responsibility now. You know, we did it for a long time. Yeah. We did it without pay. We, you know, in fact, we had to pay. We never got sponsorship until, um, I think, uh, two TDAs ago. We finally got sponsorship. But up until then, the four of us were, were footing the costs of all the Renting copies. Renting all the conventions and everything, for everything. every summer. Yeah. And- yeah. But um, you know. Well, now that you're off the board, maybe I could get get some some a little bit of dirt. Okay. Did you guys ever consider a band list, like a universal? Because <laughs> I mean, this is something that comes up a lot. We have some nefarious characters in the poker world. Mm-hmm. People, uh, you know, and and there have been individual casinos placing bands mm-hmm. on individual persons for infractions within their walls. Mm-hmm. But there's no like unifying you know, like, group of people, a lot of people think it should be the TDA, who say, no, you, sir, are banned from all TDA events. Uh, I think maybe they need to uh, develop some kind of a new board that would handle that. That is not the mission of the TDA Mm -hmm. or or one of the things that I think it would be appropriate for the TDA to do. TDA is basically about standardizing uh, tournament rules, and that's it. You know, we, we can't go and tell card rooms they have to do uh, you know, they have to charge this much juice. We can't tell them they have to structure it this way. Yeah. We're about standardizing the rules. So if the players wanted to, um, uh, and managers wanted to get together and come up with something like you're suggesting, I think that would have to be a separate entity. For would the you TDA. be for it or against it? Um, that's a good question. Um, I have I have no tolerance for assholes in poker, so <laughs> I would be uh, I I would be for it. I mean, yeah. you know, but. I, it's very difficult. There's a lot of hearsay, and you know some things uh, are not not true that that have gone down in history, probably. And so you have to, you know, you have to make sure every person gets his day in court, so to yeah. speak, before you could just say. And then who's going to pay for that court? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> I don't see it happening, but I, I would be in favor of it, probably, yeah. if there was a way to to do justice to it. Uh, let me see here. Let's talk about you know. I got to talk about ladies in the game. The the poker has gets a pass often, I think, for being very inclusive, a, a very inclusive group of people. But we can't argue the fact that the main event numbers is still 3% for women every right. year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Car Player Cruises has a 40% female rate, which mm-hmm. is outstanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, what do you think needs to happen, you know, to grow the game specifically amongst women? Well, I think I think that the main problem is that a lot of women have other responsibilities um, with the family and raising children and, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So a lot of them don't have the time to learn to play poker. And if you don't learn and you're a losing player, then you're not going to be playing long. So part of it is just the the nature of the beast is that a lot of the women are, are the homemakers. Um, for those who do play... And, and people might be upset, but, but I am stereotyping that women are not normally taught to be aggressive. Yeah. And aggression is very important in poker. And if you are not aggressive, you're probably not going to win. And then again, you're probably not going to continue to play. Um, so I, I, think it, I think it's a combination of, of some things that, that are kind of against women. Um, yeah. Now, the women who do play um, and who are professionals, I mean, they're great because they've learned... Um, you know they've learned the skills that they need, and and I don't think it's really a sexist game. Um, you know the, the controversy about should there be women's events always comes up, and and uh, you know I do support women's events. When I was younger, I didn't because I, I looked at it as hey we don't need an, a, a ladies event because right. um, we can we can compete mentally, and it's not a game of physical strength, and that's all true. However, I think it's good to have um, women's events because. 
the atmosphere is nice and it's social. And then when I when I talk to a lot of women's groups and I say to them, you know, once you become comfortable playing poker in ladies' events, then get out there and play in mixed events yeah. because you're going to have a good time. It's not like it used to be where you know it was it was miserable in the card rooms. These days, the card rooms are, are great. The atmosphere is fun, and I do believe that we can compete um, evenly with men as long as. But we've got to get that you know. Um, that barrier nice to girl entry yeah. thing out, and we've got to you know go for the jugular. It, it, There's a know. great uh, a column coming out by Gavin Griffin. I just edited it a few days ago, so uh, the uh, listeners can catch it in about a month or so in the magazine. Uh, but basically, it's called Poker and hashtag Me Too, and you know I, th- I think he does a great job. We're going to talk about Maria uh, Lampropoulos, who just won the PCA main event. Congratulations mm-hmm. to yeah. her. Um, but basically, the fact that you know uh, men need to do a better job of of uh, treating women as if they were any other person at the table, and I think even time, even like going out of your way to be nice to the to mm-hmm. the women at the table or mm-hmm. to treat them, to, um, mm-hmm. yeah, you know what I mean. Like uh, some some people just, uh, oh, you take it, sweetie. You know, you know that kind. Some that's, of them are condescending. Exactly. Yeah. It's like even even well-meaning people yeah. can, can like the be first part tournament of the I ever played in was that way. You know they. When I signed up, I was the first woman to ever play in one at the Las Vegas Club, and they were mm-hmm. like, oh, honey, if you win, we're going to give you a free buy-in for life. And the reality <laughs> is when I got to the final table, all of a sudden it was eight men against me, and they, yeah. they were plotting, you know, how, how are we going to get her out? So, yeah, I mean, being being nice, not just to women, so but they, to they everyone. they actually ganged up on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Being, being nice to everyone is important. You know, sometimes I'm at the table and somebody will say a cuss word, and and the dealer will say, uh, "Sir, there's ladies present." And I say, "You know what? There's there's people present. It's not about there you go exactly. A, you know, a a lady well, at the that's table. a great example of a well-meaning person who's trying to look out for you, but is actually you know right setting the movement back a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but obviously, we'd love to see more women come in and play, and uh, I'm happy that so many women do play on the cruises. I think uh, I think there's an intimidation factor just walking into a poker room for the first time. And um, women yeah. are probably more intimidated than men. And, yeah. You know, I hate to stereotype, but I, I, I think that's true. Well, when the day comes, you know, when we have a main event female winner. Yeah, then that will, that will increase uh, the, the uh, percentage of women playing the next year. Because, yeah. you know, they'll look at it and say, hey, she can do it. I can do it. Of course. That's, you know, when I won my World Series bracelet, um, I was so happy that... Not for me personally, but for me as a woman, because it's like, okay, ladies, we can do this. You know, come and play. We so you were the this. second open winner ever? Oh, that's interesting. Actually, I was the third, but that in itself is a story because the headlines say, the headline said, Linda Johnson, second woman to win WSOP. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, I was the third. I was there when Vera Richmond won, and I was there when Barbara Enright won. So, <laughs> so you I must went, have been third. <laughs> so I went and I said, why isn't Vera's name in the record books? And I said, well, because she was a bitch. Okay. Okay. Well, she was a bitch. I knew this woman. She was nasty. She which, wait, which event did she win? She won, she won the, stu- after Barbara. Stud, I believe it, no, she was the first woman. Oh, she was yeah. the first. Yeah, and she wow, won the stud forgotten. event. Wow, forgotten. Scrubbed from the record books. Yes, she was. Yeah, I think she's back in now because we campaigned to get her back in because, you know, she was, she was nasty. I mean, she was in a wheelchair. She could cuss with the best of them. And um, and the men hated her, and yeah. so so when she won, she didn't get the credit. I said, "Look, there's plenty of men assholes who have won, and they're in the record books. You have to put her in." Yeah. So I do believe that now she is listed as the first. But that was kind of a funny story, <laughs> just to show you what a men's what was world. Was Vera what? Vera Richmond. You can Vera Google Richmond. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to Google some. She was the Vera from Vera's Sheets. So okay. had lots of money and just a, a foul, foul temper. <laughs> All that sheet money makes you angry, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's talk about the bracelet. I mean, uh, Ooh. 1997 Raz. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, poker boom hadn't happened yet. but yeah. uh, Oh, the day started out to be a nightmare. Um, back in those days... Um, Card Player Magazine was putting its advertisers on the cover, and we still do that sometimes. Sometimes you still do, right? But but we never had players on the cover. It was always advertisers, and that was part of their contract was mm-hmm. they got a cover. And so that morning we were supposed to go to press, and the cover from a very well known uh, casino had not come in yet, and it came in that morning. And I took a look mm-hmm. at the cover, 
and the the card room was under construction and so they had a picture of a woman in daisy dukes um, <laughs> lots of cleavage you know and she had like a sander between her legs and they were saying you know we're renovating mm -hmm. you know was the the concept pardon and, our dust <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but but it looked like something that would be on penthouse maybe you know mm -hmm. not in in card player so so this is how my day started. So I called the advertiser and I said, I'm sorry, but we're not going to put this on the cover of Card Player Magazine. And uh, they started arguing with me and they said, well, we're the advertiser. And if you don't do it, we're going to pull our advertising. This yeah. was a two page advertiser at the time. And I said, look, I and hate the cover kind yeah. of important. I said, I hate to say no, but I said, I, you asked me to come down and talk to your ladies, you know, um, a couple times a year. And I do, I said, I'm going to feel like such a hypocrite. I said, not only that, but if we send this cover into, um, like Bellagio, they'll just throw mm -hmm. it out. They're not going to put this out. This was 1997. Remember? Yeah. It's not the same as 2017. Um, but, and they would have thrown it out. And I said, you're not going to get the coverage you need. And I'm sorry, but, uh, I'm not doing it. So they said, call us back at two o'clock. Now the final table started at four o'clock. So I'm, <laughs> I'm upset the whole time because I'm thinking I can't afford to lose this advertiser, but at the same time, I'm not going to, you know, compromise just shot on, a bracelet. Uh, I'm not going to compromise my principles. So I call back at two o'clock right before I head down to the world series and they've got their attorneys on their on the line and they start threatening, threatening me again. You know, if you don't do this. And I said, my the final answer is no, I'm not putting it on there, you know? Yeah. And uh, we had some generic covers waiting and we just put it on there. And uh, a couple of weeks later, they actually increased their advertising. So I was really happy about that. So I head down to the World Linda Series. Linda puts her foot down. Yeah, I had I had to. It was a, it was a matter of principle. So I head down to the World Series. I wanted to get there early because, um, like a Still dog opinions. sniffs out its territory, right? Yeah. I wanted to you know to breathe because I'd had this horrible morning. I was so emotionally upset. Uh, worried because we needed their advertising and so I, I wanted to get down there and, and just decompress for a few minutes and I walked in and they had put up stands and uh, there were people in the stands and they all had um, they were wearing hats that said go Linda <laughs> <laughs> they had signs that said go Linda <laughs> Still, sorry you may have been the first uh, poker player with fans. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was my friends, you know. Yeah. But um, that's fine. I have a vivid memory of yeah. myself being in Binions, winning uh -huh. a tournament, a small yeah. side event, a couple summers ago. But, uh -huh. And and I had friends come in and come, and they made signs. Yeah, it was, was it like, was really <laughs> cool. Really and when I saw that, I felt sorry for my opponents because I'm like, man, I've got so you know, this yeah. is home court advantage now. Was and, this upstairs in the? Uh, in the bullpen or it was or downstairs in the, the downstairs yeah. it was downstairs yeah um but it, but it was so cool and um men win was wearing a hat that said go linda he was one of my final table <laughs> opponents and i beat him in a pot and he, t he threw the hat on the ground so. <laughs> but but um it was it was a man hasn't cheered for anyone since <laughs> <laughs> it was a moment in life that i'll never forget and winning that bracelet you know yeah. meant everything to me and winning it as a woman meant everything because you know it, um you know just women didn't win bracelets back there today there's probably 20 women that have won bracelets but back then no yeah and then you put yourself on the next cover of card player <laughs> no i didn't actually <laughs> I, I didn't have that much nerve <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right uh let's see here poker gives we got to mention that so on top of you know being kick-ass ambassador for the game and fighting for player rights and dealer rights and you know just being an overall amazing presence in the sport if you will what what was poker gives all about why um, there weren't a lot of, of charities back then, mm -hmm. um, no, no specific charity. I, I believe there's a couple these days, but, um, Mike Sexton and Jan Fisher and Lisa Tenner and I decided, um, if everybody would give like one, 1% 1 of their tournament winnings, we could really help charity a lot. Yeah. So we established poker gives, um, we didn't have the resources to spend, you know, these days when they have a big charity event, they might spend a million dollars. Uh, to raise a million and a half dollars or yeah. two million, but we didn't have those resources. So we, we called it kind of the poor man's charity. I mean, uh, you know, just give us $5, $10, $20. And we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, five and $10 at a time. And um, we ran it for many, many years. Um, we turned it over to Lupe Soto, who runs it today. Uh, it is a 501c3, and it still is in existence, but we were very happy with the money that we were able to um, to give yeah. to charity on behalf of poker players. I think that's kind of what started, like, 
because poker has a great reputation for giving back. Now you have charity events every right. year at the World Series of yep. Poker. You have poker players who are starting their own charities, like mm -hmm. Greg Charity. Uh, you know, the fact that poker players, you know, Dan Smith has just raised millions on his right. own, right. you know, are so charitable and giving back mm -hmm. goes against what a lot of people's, you know, first instinct is of a poker player. Yeah. Somebody uh, who, you know, will take money at all costs. Right. Poker players are a, a generous group. Um, they have integrity as a whole. They, I mean, uh, a lot, I think, I think poker raises more money for charity than any other sport does in the world. I yeah. mean, it's just, it's amazing the millions of dollars that poker players have, have, um, you know, given to charity. Let's do some rapid fire questions. So, oh. uh, biggest pot you ever won or lost your choice. Um, biggest pot I ever won was, uh, probably... Oh, in in the seventy five one fifty game, it, it was you know probably eight thousand cap 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 you know <laughs> everybody in kind of thing scoop miracle card on the river and a scoop a little so. sweat forming <laughs> a little sweat yeah a little towel <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was at the World Series yeah um, who's the best poker player we've never heard of now when I ask people this and they are like. 30 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they talk about their buddy who's right. about to pop. Uh -huh. But uh, what about people over the years maybe who ha didn't get their their fair share of attention who deserved it? Um, Mike Landers, was probably nobody's heard of Mike Landers, but he was uh, my uh, mentor and my guru and he, he would come to mind as, as yeah. somebody that, that not many people have heard of that's a great poker player. He was the guy who took you under his wing yes. and showed you the ropes of... Yes, uh-huh. So, Mike Landers. So what did that entail back in the day? <laughs> oh, don't watch out for that guy. He, he he's a he's a cheat. Or uh. <laughs> um, I I think the poker games that I've been in have been cl clean throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't really worry about getting cheated when I'm at a casino. I don't play in in home games because I don't want to have to worry about stuff or yeah. worry about getting raided or, or that kind of stuff. Underground games, but. Um, yeah, it was it was just different back then, and I was young, and you know, um, I got kind of thrown into the the wolf's den, uh, the lion's den, very early. But you know, I could always, I could always defend myself. I, yeah. I, I I can't say it was really hard for me, but it was hard for everyone, especially the dealers. The, the dealer abuse back in the day was horrible, and yeah. people just didn't respect them, and and you know. Today, it's, it's an entirely different story. I could see like little trace amounts of it in 2006, 2007, mm -hmm. and it's night and day different from then. Yeah. So yeah. I can't even imagine what it was like in the <laughs> 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not fun. Uh, best swap or piece you ever had of anybody? Oh. I'm I'm not one who really does. Uh, you don't believe that, in so, people. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's not. That I don't believe in people. Um, uh, but I'm I'm not a swapper, and I don't buy pieces of, yeah. of people. So, uh, favorite degen story. Favorite degen story. Prop betting. Are you? Wow. Are you? Were you one to to uh, to take outrageous prop bets? Not outrageous prop bets, but I will bet on anything. I mean, if I go to the grocery store, I'll bet on the over-under for the total. Or This is you, know. you being 21 and get, having that itch <laughs> to play blackjack. Exactly. Um, a prop bet. Some of the ones I've heard about are pretty amazing. Like, um, I think it was Huck Seed th thought he could um, tread water for 24 hours. And, oh, yeah, and neck then, deep in the ocean yeah. or in a pool or something and like that. And then the bet, uh, you know, would, would Howard Letterer eat a... A cheeseburger for ten thousand dollars. I like that one. Or the guy who lived vegan, yeah. who lived in the um, in the Bellagio bathroom for thirty days. Or mm -hmm. the man with the hundred thousand dollar breasts. By the way, he showed up for a taping and he did reveal those breasts. You saw everyone. them? Yes, I saw them. So how they look? Well, I wish mine looked like that. Let's just say that <laughs> <laughs> they were perky. Yeah. That, what was that guy's name? He was like I don't uh, remember his name, but yeah, he, someone gave him six figures to get to, to get implants, breast implants, and he yeah. kept them. Yes, because he said he, women, he said like women them. like them. Yeah, I, I don't get that. But um, yeah, but they were impressive.
Maybe women <laughs> like them compared to what was there before. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> Uh, are you a headphones at the table person? No, I'm not. I'm a social person at the table. Mm-hmm. I like to talk, and I like. I feel like if it's a happy game, people don't mind giving you their money. So I try to, <laughs> uh, you know. And plus, I'm like the defender of the live one. When anybody tries to, how could you play that hand? I'm like, well, Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> kick him under the table. <laughs> yeah, but I defend. The, I defend. Everyone Can I see at the you table. for a moment outside? <laughs> I love it when they say to me, "How could you make that call?" I said, "Well, I have a good job." So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my money that's why <laughs> right. um yeah so when you're when you are listening to music what what is linda like linda likes soft um soft music and classic rock i like the 70s classic rock okay. and uh, when i have the tv on i'm on station 919 which is soft music what is soft music um music from the uh 70s that isn't classic rock but, oh, okay so <laughs> the lighter, you know, listening music. So. Nice acoustic. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Uh, any poker rules? Actually, this is a perfect question for you. Any poker rules that you are not a fan of or that needs to be changed, altered, done away with? Well, I did not. I was one of the ones who resisted showing, um, having to show your cards uh, to the cameras. I, I didn't like that rule. I, I'm still not in favor of it, although I do think it... it you know, I can, I can you see why. The WPT. I know, I know. I can That's see why they have thing. it. That's kind of their whole thing. Yeah, and 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 again, I think I was wrong not to like that rule because it certainly has helped grow poker. Um, you and Eric Seidel. Yeah, Eric. Eric really didn't like that rule either. But I mean, I just didn't want to give out trade secrets and stuff like that. But it, it was good for poker, and it was the right decision, I think. So rules today that I don't like. Um, no, I, I think I'm I'm good with all of them, pretty much. Any yeah. rule you'd like to add in? Um, if you're an asshole, you can't play poker. I'd love to see that. You know? <laughs> this is why I was trying to get that banning, you know, yeah, yeah, group yeah. together. Um, so, uh, not asking, not asking to see somebody's hand. I think it's horrible when somebody asks to see somebody's hand, um, just to get information or to needle them. If it's because they think that, uh, there's collusion or something, then they need to call the floor. But I, I think that should be a definite rule that you can't just ask to see somebody's hand just to get information. I think you and I disagree on that one. <laughs> so, so. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because it makes people play better. If they know they're going to have to sh- show their hand, they're going to play better. I can better. see that so, argument. So that's why I don't I even don't ask like. in most. I just, I just, I think I like to defend the right to ask. But yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it some makes people, people do play better. Like, some, the people who ask are always the ones you don't want to play with. Right, right. Uh. And, and some people do it to needle other people. And I just, I don't, I want a happy atmosphere. And once somebody asks to see your hand, it, you know, it, it puts people on alert that, hey, you know, this is a serious game. So. What about tanking? Can we talk about tanking? Tanking. I, I don't get it. I, 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 there should definitely be a rule. That's one we could add that, you know, uh, you know, I like the idea of the shot clock. I, I don't know what in the hell people think about for so long. I'd like a dollar for everyone who's pretending to do the math because they're not for the most part. I mean, uh, so I, I think that tanking is ridiculous. And um, the decisions come much quicker when you're playing Omaha eight or better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, when I, when I've watched the world series, um, over the past few years and I've seen people, you know, just being outrageous and tanking so long, you know, and they say it's my right to do. Well, it shouldn't be your right to do. That you should you should have to act in a reasonable amount of time. Let's do it. <laughs> you got some juice over at the TDA. No. Let's make no. every tournament a shot clock. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would definitely uh, be better to watch as a poker mm-hmm. reporter. That's for sure. Right. Um, I don't know if this applies to you. Did you. Was there a poker pro that you admired coming up? And did you ever get to play a pot with him or her? Yes. Um, I think the two poker pros that I admire most are Mike Sexton and Barry Greenstein. And I have had many occasions to play with both of them. So. All right. Who but, got the better of who in, e- in each case? Oh, who can remember all that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think we've all, we're probably about even uh, mm-hmm. uh, in the long run. But, well, do you have any uh, early Barry G stories? I heard Mike's point of view from his uh, early games. Um, not really, no. Um, he, he's been on a couple of our cruises and always had a good time. And um, he's just a really fun guy. He, he kind of portrayed himself when I, he did the podcast as kind of like a, an outsider, like just kind of didn't want to... He would come, collect his money, and leave, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't think he gets as much respect from some of the players as he should because, um, you know, he... he 
not only is he a good player, but he's he's a great person. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, he speaking of charity, he was the first one who really donated um, his tournament winnings to charity. Right. And, you the know, evil, I, the I definition him. of charity. That yeah, guy. Yeah, I definitely respect Barry. Uh, I don't know if you had many jobs before poker, but do you remember the worst? I made beds in a hospital. Okay. <laughs> when I was 14. That was my first job. And then I worked at a, a tuna fish company, Starkus Tuna Fish. Uh, oh, I was, man. <laughs> I was a billing clerk, luckily. I wasn't oh, in the you factory. Were, okay. But, um, <laughs> but, but we were right smell. next door to the factory, and it did <laughs> stink. So uh, those were probably my two worst jobs. There must be some horror stories in the hospital, though. That, I, I can't. <laughs> yeah, making can't beds when people died. That was my main job. Oh, so. man. <laughs> That's heavy for a 14 year old. Yeah. Um, what would you be doing if 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 it wasn't for poker? If it wasn't for poker, I would have been a lawyer. I think. I, okay. I, I love advocating and I love debating, and I think I I would have. In in fact, I actually applied to law school when I was like thirty five, and I got accepted, but I fell in love and uh bef- and before my first day. I, Wait, so you, uh, we took quit. the LSAT for fun? Huh? You took the LSAT just for yeah, fun, just yeah. to see if I, you could pass it. Yes, and, and I got a, I got I got in, uh, but I never went my first day because I fell <laughs> in love with a poker player, and we just wanted to travel and play poker. Yeah, so. man, that's crazy. <laughs> um, this question is inspired by you. Have you ever felt bad about taking someone's money? Actually, yes, I have, and I know that that's not part of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> when especially older men, uh, some. Older men have reminded me of my father, and oh, um, so it's like a, so, a weird so I just trigger or something. Yeah, I, so it, you know, I felt bad. I still did my job. I, I think that if you respect the game, your job is to win yeah. money. And um, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't show favoritism at the table. I will check raise. Uh, my best friend. I have check raised my mother, um, but but yes, when when it's somebody who's older and um, maybe not as capable as other players, and and they're going to lose their money, the only justification in my mind is at least I'm going to respect them. I'm not going to take their money and laugh at them. I'm going to yeah. take their money and make sure that they have a, a good time. I always have three principles when I go to play. One is uh, my 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 objectives is to. Win money, of course, mm-hmm. um, to have a good time and to make sure that my opponents have a good time. And all three of those are very important to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th- I think most players only have one, so that's admirable <laughs> right there. Uh, we end the podcast the same way every time uh, with a question from the random question generator. Okay. And uh, your question is, what movie scene chokes you up the most? What movie scene? Um, Do you have a go-to cry movie? Uh, yes, uh, Dirty Dancing, I think. Uh, you Nobody know. puts baby in the corner. Exactly, yeah. That's that, the scene? <laughs> the, the scene where, the, the, where they do the dance on stage. <clears throat> oh, okay, at the end. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. love that scene. So, And that's my favorite movie. Happy Tears, then. Yeah, Happy Tears. You don't put on like a, a morbid no, scene No, I cry anything? when I'm happy. I don't cry okay. when I'm angry. I, I cry a lot. Um, but they're always when I'm happy. You know, I feel so blessed in life. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it just, I, I'm thankful every day. Yeah. What's, what's your cry rate in movies? What's your percentage? Small. Um, like, like scenes that most people cry at, I don't cry at. So, okay. um, you know, sadness doesn't make me cry as much as, as happiness does. If it's a sports movie, I'm like 82% to cry. Really? I love sports Moments movies. Moments of triumph Remember the always Titans get me. And, and the, yeah. and all those sports movies, I love them. Love them, love them. <laughs> Steel Magnolias, okay, that'll yeah. set me off. <laughs> yeah, I, see, I didn't even cry in that one. So no? Everybody else did, but no. Monster. I don't Sally cry when Field I'm was sad. so good. <laughs> yeah, when I'm sad, I, I, I buckle up, I guess, and, and I just, I, I get through it. But when I'm uh, happy is when I cry. Perfect, perfect. Linda, thank you so much. It's for been a pleasure. Awesome, thank you. That's the show. Thanks again to Linda for her time. You can follow her on Twitter at First Lady Poker. Or you can literally follow her from country to country with card player cruises. I think they have like seven cruises scheduled so far for 2018 to places like uh, the Caribbean, uh, the Mexican Riviera, uh, I think even New Zealand is on the list. You can get more info at cardplayercruises.com. If you like what you heard, please hit the subscribe button. If you rate Poker Stories and leave us a review, let us know about it with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com and we'll hook you up with a digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening. Attention American poker players! Do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? 
Then head to GlobalPoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for U.S. players. That's GlobalPoker.com. 